Coming up, COVID canceled the Santa Fe Indian Market last year, but this year the plaza was packed. We'll find out what Indian Market was like despite the lingering pandemic. Plus, policy appropriations and the Biden administration. We'll get a Washington update from Holly Cook Makaro. I'm Patty Thawahungva. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalohungva. U.S. Secretary of Labor Martin Walsh makes a stop in Phoenix to help prepare a native workforce before the infrastructure bill passes. Secretary Walsh met with natives who use resources at the Phoenix Indian Center. He says the Biden-Harris administration is working to make historic investments with the bipartisan infrastructure bill and its Build Back Better agenda. His visit highlighted the preparations needed to build a workforce tribes will need once they get the funding. The Phoenix Indian Center plans on training hundreds of people in trades like welding and carpentry, so they're ready to go to work for tribes. The money for that training will also come from the infrastructure bill. Uh, I was just asked a question by a reporter about, you know, people worrying about the spending. It's too much spending. It's not about spending, it's about investment. And right now we're at a moment in time where we can make investments in, in people. The Phoenix Indian Center was the first urban Indian center established in the country. It serves more than 7,000 indigenous people from more than 100 tribes. The center offers workshops, education, and social service programs. The Department of Labor's Division of Indian and Native American Programs funds the center's skills training and employment services to help reduce unemployment. Secretary Walsh is also going to the Pueblo of Jemez in New Mexico to meet with tribal leaders and discuss economic development on tribal lands. Lawmakers are asking the Indian Health Service for assistance in responding to the trauma of Indian boarding schools. 21 Democratic members of Congress informed IHS last week. They're asking the federal agency to provide culturally appropriate ser support services to those who feel triggered by information about the abuse of schools. The move comes as the Interior Department announced its formal investigation into government-run boarding schools. Now lawmakers are requesting hotlines and programs to aid in survivor and descendants' mental health. Advocacy groups say the trauma resources are needed urgently. In a statement, agency officials said they are reviewing the request and discussing what steps to take next. The president of the Navajo Nation says all employees will need to be fully vaccinated by the end of September, or be required to submit regular COVID testing results. Jonathan Nez says the goal is to keep the people and the government healthy. He issued this statement saying, with so many of our employees working directly with our Navajo people, we have to take measures to keep everyone safe and healthy. Nez says the mandate will help avoid the tribal nation's government being shut down again. Currently, more than 80% of the tribe's workers are fully vaccinated. Forest fires are raging along Bolivia's border with Brazil and impacting indigenous communities there. Authorities say 15 fires have yet to be contained and continue to threaten nearby communities. This includes the indigenous communities living with the Nembe Guasu Conservation Area. It's the first conservation area created for indigenous autonomy and was established in the Bolivian constitution in 2009. The mayor of a nearby town, Jose Diaz, says the devastation is widespread. It's very sad that we must inform the citizens that the fire that began on the 17th until today has traversed 34 miles and is three miles wide. And as of today's date, there are 193 square miles burning. These were controlled burns that quickly got out of hand due to dry and windy conditions. 
A part of the United, Na United Homa Nation's history is in danger of being sold off. The tribe had been taking care of a building that was once a school for Native children in Louisiana. Prior to 1953, children from the Homa Nation were not allowed to be educated in public schools there. NOLA.com reports six years ago, the nation set out to convert the long-abandoned school into a museum and cultural center. The tribe had the building insured, maintained the grounds, made some repairs, and got the building on the National Register of Historic Places. A federal judge ruled in June the school board does not have to renew an agreement with the tribe and can sell the building to anyone. August Krapel, the principal chief of the Homa United Homa Nation, says this part of the tribe's history needs to be preserved. Well, it's very important of our nation's history, you know. I mean, uh, you know, to some people that's not Native or whatever, this is just an old building. But to us, this is our history. You know, this is the only, you know, uh, uh, Native American Indian school here in Terrebonne Parish. And um, our, our people weren't allowed to go to school until the 1960s. The state-recognized tribe wants to buy the building. A crowdfunding link is on its website. Well, it's a victory for Callie K.O. Reese, who retains her World Boxing Association super lightweight title. Reese won her fight by a majority decision on Friday night against Diana Prezak and added the International Boxing Organization belt to her collection. It was her first time defending her title. The event was held at the Saquon Casino Resort in California and streamed on UFC Fight Pass. She was introduced by Kumeyaay bird singers as she entered the ring. Reese is from the Sikonk Wampanoag tribe in Providence, Rhode Island, and her record now stands at 18 wins, 7 losses, and 1 draw. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Lots of native bling, art, and fashion in Santa Fe, New Mexico this past weekend. How was India market this year? We'll find out. Plus, Holly Cook Macaro joins us to talk about politics and policy. The Santa Fe Indian Market has brought together Native American artists from around the U.S. for 98 years, millions of visitors and collectors from around the world. It's widely known as the place where Native American art and culture meets the world. To give us some insight on her visit, we have Jennifer Lauren, who is an Emmy-winning journalist and documentarian. She is also the executive producer, director, and host of OCO, Voices of the Cherokee People. Welcome, Jennifer. OCO, thank you for having me. Well, let's start with uh, the big, big bird's eye view. What did it look like this year? So I've been to uh, Indian Market in Santa Fe for many years, and we got there um, midweek before the market started. And as soon as you know, I landed in Santa Fe, I could tell there was a difference this year because usually the city is already buzzing and there are a lot of people um, descending on uh, Santa Fe as you get closer to market. And I noticed that, you know, for example, our hotel, the lobby was empty. Um, and so there were just not as many people there leading up to the market. Um, but then, you know, a Friday before the market hit, I mean, we it definitely, we saw an influx of people. Um, and then the market itself was very much just like a regular uh, Indian market. Um, there were not as many people though, that's for sure. The tension with artists, I mean, they've gone through so many transitions in the past 18 months. Um, was there a sense of optimism about life coming back or is there still a tension with the new variant? Yeah, it seemed like to me that um, in all of the, with all of the artists that we talked to, the overwhelming um, kind of message that they gave us was that they didn't know what to expect this year. Like they've been doing Indian market every year. They usually know exactly what to expect, but this year was a big unknown. Um, and so a lot of people were pleasantly surprised, they said, and that it did seem like they were hopeful where they thought, oh, wow, we didn't really know if we would have that many buyers and collectors that came, but they ended up being pleasantly surprised with the number of people that were there and they were selling out and, and you know, 
more people were purchasing their art than they had expected. So yeah, it seemed pretty hopeful. But of course, everybody was being very careful. I have to say that, you know, people were the majority, the large majority of people were wearing masks and that included the artists as well. So that was good. Let's talk about the art. Um, what blew you away? Oh, um, I think there were several things that blew me away. There's one piece in particular, um, I sent you guys a picture of it that um, was um, an otter that um, an artist had, it was a taxidermied otter, but then he had on regalia that and and wampum jewelry and beadwork and it I've never seen anything like it because every like the taxidermy is an art the quill work that it had on was an art the feather work that it had on was an art the wampum was an art I mean it really just blew me away um and then there were um the jewelry, that's, that's my favorite part of Indian market always. I try to find some unique um, native jewelry that I might not find here in Oklahoma. Um, and I will say every year, the jewelry just gets better and better. And um, I love the way that artists and, and jewelry makers are thinking of new ways to do native jewelry. Um, and um, I, I, can't, I can't get enough of it. This has been such a transition for many um, of us, whether it's writing or journalism and art. How are folks sit talking about how the world has changed and what they're doing differently now, if at all? I think um, some people, I think because of their, there's so many things up in the air, um, as far as like uh, artists not really knowing what to expect. One thing that we noticed was that um, they had lowered their prices, some of them, not everyone, but um, we were seeing uh, the same artists that we see each year at Indian Art Market with pieces that were what I would consider deeply discounted, you know? And when I would ask them, I'd say, well, you guys, you're, why is this price like this? And they're like, well, we didn't really know what to expect. And so, um, so I think that's one way that people are adjusting. And I think they also just didn't create as much as they normally would have for Indian market. Um, and not by a lot, you know, it's not like they were creating half, but I would say that they, um, because they didn't know what to expect, their, their booths had fewer things in them. Um, but, but there was also a lot of, um, there were more booths this year with fashion designers, um, you know, that were selling clothing with, um, their uh, indigenous prints and things like that on them. And that was really neat to see as well. We really noticed that on social media that just one, that there were more designers, but two, they were going kind of a combination of being in person and out on social media to uh, tout their goods. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, with Instagram and the way that artists are finding their um, audience and finding their communities of people who support them and buy their work, Instagram has been such a game changer for all those artists. And so you're exactly right. There were a lot of artists that were, um, you know, selling in person, but then also, you know, having people follow them on Instagram and buying on their websites and things like that. But it was, it was, um, it was really good though, to see that, you know, people were still there in person and, and buying, touching and feeling things and, and, and buying things in person. And I understand you didn't get to the other markets, but just to set the stage for uh, viewers, Santa Fe is just a, a lot going on all at once. It's not just the Indian market, but it's also a fashion show and a film festival and and uh, two other markets. It is. Um, and so I, it, you, you simply can't do it all. <laughs> I challenge someone to do it all because I just don't know how it's possible. Um, you know, we didn't even see all of the Indian market because there's so many booths. Um, but we also, you know, had tickets to art shows that were happening, you know, at the same time. And so we didn't just spend all of our time down on the plaza at the art market, but yeah, there's a free Indian market. Um, and I did walk by that on the way to an art show and it was packed. Um, and it didn't look like, you know, much had changed as far as the number of people that were uh, artists that were there. And then there were some art shows at casinos and other parts of towns. There was a concert that we really wanted to go to that we didn't end up, we got in a traffic jam and didn't make it to the concert. But, um, but there's um, also the Sovereign. That's another thing I should say when you ask what blew me away, the Sovereign um, market that was there at the Fonda Hotel. It's like right there as part of Indian market, but it's its own separate. And that is um, 
an art market that was in the ballroom of the La Fonda and they had several like contemporary native arts and artists in there. And so I'm a big fan of, you know, indigenous pop art. And so we found all of that in there and found new indigenous voices, new artists that I'd never heard of before. Um, and everyone in there was excited to be there and just wanted to talk to you and show you what they had been working on. And that, um, I have to say, we bought a couple of pieces in that indigenous, I mean, in that sovereign art show that, um, will definitely be hanging on our walls there. It's really a, a great show. Yesterday, the uh, Alaska Federation of Natives announced it was postponing its convention until uh, December, which is another major art market. And um, I'm just curious, were people saying, yeah, we're still gonna get out on the road or was Santa Fe seem to be it for people and going back to online? You know, I, I don't think that I talked to um, anybody about that. And so, I, I don't think I could answer that well. I, I I didn't hear from anybody what their the, you know where they were going next. It was all really pretty much about you know what the Indian market was like and and the fact that there were people there and people everyone was wearing masks. That's mostly what we talked about. And, and you're working on a documentary while you were there. Tell us more about it. <laughs> sure. So our TV show OCO Voices of the Cherokee People is a docu series, and so what we do is um, we're in our seventh season, and we tell short documentaries on Cherokee Nation citizens. And so um, we were doing um, a short documentary on Patsy Phillips, who is the director of the IAIA Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. She's a Cherokee Nation citizen, so we spent a few days with her leading up to and getting all of that hustle and bustle leading up to Indian Market and the art show that she had going on there at the museum. Um, and then we did um, a, another story on a beadwork artist um, named Taylor Gutierrez, who is um, an up and coming young artist and I'm obsessed with her beadwork. And so uh, we spent a couple of days with her as well. Um, and she is a student at IAIA. So um, all, Santa Fe is kind of new to her. This was her first Indian market. So it was fun to be there for that. I can imagine uh, the excitement of that first time. Did she talk about that? Oh yeah, she was, I mean, she was planning her day and finding people to go with and she didn't really know what to expect. So we kind of filled her in on like, don't worry, you can't see it all. <laughs> um, but we also, I had my daughter with me um, because my sister had an art show actually um, at art market at the Mokna on the, the Friday night before. And so my whole family was out there and I brought my daughter um, who is eight and it was her first time going. And you know, with kids that young, you don't really know how what to expect, but she absolutely they loved it. She got some beaded earrings. She wore them to the first day of school. So um, I think that it, it was really fun to see people at their first art market. We mentioned in the intro that uh, this art market is almost 100 years old. And yet we're at a moment now when all of a sudden there's an explosion of, particularly on television, indigenous uh, representation. Uh, did that spirit come across at Santa Fe? Um, I think so. I, I think it, everyone is, there's a moment happening right now and it's undeniable. People know it. We talk about it. It's in our regular everyday conversation, you know, about all of the, the like reservation dogs and other things that are happening with um, indigenous rep, uh, representation. And so, um, yeah, it's definitely a part of everyone's conversation. And it's a, it's a really uh, hopeful time right now. And we got to keep that going. So exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, and Mark, it's a pleasure to be with you. You, you guys do such wonderful things for Indian country. So I appreciate you having me on. When we come back, a look at policy in Washington. We'll be right back. Holly Cook Macaro joins us now to talk politics and policy. She's a partner with Spirit Rock Consulting and is a regular contributor to our news program. Welcome, Holly. Thanks, Mark. Good to see you. So here we are. It's late August. We know that um, when September kicks in, things start ramping up. Let's step back and pull the lens back and just take a look at how things are going so far, particularly with the Biden administration. 
this is actually the it's a very timely question. It was just August 20th that marked one year since uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris accepted the nomination at the Democratic Convention in 2020. So we're, we're one year in the and we've got huge week in the House, which is really carrying the bulk of um, the Biden priorities for this administration. But for Indian country, it's been extraordinary. We've had, I, well, I think it was a bit of a shock to the system and how quickly on January 20th, just the next day, things went back to what I, I think we all um, feel was the normal routine of, of operations and process within the walls of the White House. And when we look at how Indian country is doing at this point, the biggest thing is obviously the nomination and confirmation of Deb Holland as the Secretary of the Interior. And and I, I, I want to call it historic, but I don't even think it covers the scope of how it brought the corners of Indian country together. And I'll touch on that again. But some of the, 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 the significant actual pieces that we've seen with the reestablishment of the White House Council on Native American Affairs, the swift and appropriate response to the news out of Canada with the, the horrific discovery of the, the children's graves at their boarding schools and how quickly that uh, Secretary Holland addressed that and came up with a plan. That was um, extraordinary, I think. Um, we are seeing, we saw last week, the continued appointments of, of non-natives to, uh, to not traditionally native roles within the administration. Uh, we, we've got, you know, all the all the usual spots with assistant secretary, etc. Uh, the assistant secretary for Indian Affairs is what I'm referring to. But we also have Janie Hip, who's the general counsel at the Department of Agriculture. We have Bob Anderson, who's been nominated and is awaiting confirmation in the Senate as the solicitor at Interior, the top lawyer. And um, and with Chuck Sams last week as the direct as the nomination as the director for the National Park Service, I, I think we'll continue to see a few more of those come out, which it once again is extraordinary. This might be approaching. This could be the administration already that has appointed more Native Americans to these non traditionally Native um, spots within the administration, and that is that is extraordinary. The other big thing we've seen that. I think Indian country sees and feels on the ground um, when you're not in the thick of things um, in, in DC and on the Hill is, is the impacts of the investments uh, out of the American Rescue Plan. The, that what, that's the 20, the $20 billion that was in their four tribal governments overall a 32.5, right in the ballpark there. Uh, but that $20 billion number is the number that was put out you know, last spring that was originally proposed by, by House Democrats and Speaker Pelosi, and that came out as $8 billion in the CARES Act, which Indian country was, you know, ecstatic over because we just have not seen that sort of additional investment outside of the usual budget process. So the $20 billion in addition, which represented a lot, you know, the long-term investment, that I that is a direct result of the type of advocacy and priority and uh, support coming out of the White House. So hitting the ground running on those things uh, it, at this point, I, I I'm giving the the uh, Biden Harris administration um, I a good grade for for the effort so far. Certainly, no no one is perfect, and and there are there are things that we that we can all work on. The um, when I refer to what the scope of Deb Holland's nomination has been, I saw it bring together as someone who who really works on, on campaigns, politics, um, and those pieces, it brought together corners of Indian country from from the the uh, folks within the walls to the uh, advocacy group, the grassroots groups that all came together in a way that were able to support the nomination that I just hadn't seen before in terms of the coordination, the messaging, um, and really Kind of using each other's strengths. There's tribal leader um, support. There's grassroots support that can just activate people and um, outside groups right away. And uh, we really saw that. And so I, I think this the, the nomination of Deb Holland also drove this this political evolution. I think it really took us to the next level. And that look at history, and that's when you start seeing movement. And I was thinking just with these appointments. 
Right now, corporate boards, for example, are less than one-tenth of one percent. But with all of these really serious appointments, it's not going to be long before they start showing up in corporate board reports. Absolutely. And, and getting folks into these appointments, it's part of getting them into the pipeline. We look back 20 years ago, and I don't know that we had the folks that 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 with the types of resumes and experiences that have um, teed up folks like Janie Hip, Bob Anderson, Chuck Sams, and others to to be in you know in the mix and consideration for these non-native traditional roles, and that again is the next step. So we get we there there are so many skilled and talented native professionals working in Washington D.C. that that in the pipeline, you know, teeing it up. I've been there 24 years. And it is extraordinary, you know, how much has changed in that time. And the next step, corporate boards. Those are important. Those voices in terms of how we are represented and and the, the conversation about representation that each of these appointments brings, each of these 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 victories in terms of, of name changes, representation in the media. Corporate boards, that's that's next. I agree. Exciting times, Holly. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.